Hi, everyone. Welcome. I know some of you are still coming in. I'm Jeannie Ralston, and I'm the founder of Next Tribe. And we're so excited to have Ann Burt with us tonight. Um, Ann has just written a debut novel. I actually have the novel. I'll go get it. I forgot to have it with me. A debut novel called The Dig. There's, there it is. There it is. And you can see it in the cover in back of me. It's a fascinating family, a drama of family and corporate intrigue. And it's, it's very modern in that sense, but it's based on the classic, the Greek classic Antigone. So we're going to find out how that classic of Greek literature informed this modern story of, of fa a family in uh, Minnesota. Let me read you a little bit about Anne, before, and then we're going to, um, she's going to read a little bit from her book. But Anne is the editor of My Father Married Your Mother. Dispatches from the Blended Family and co-editor with Christina Baker Klein of About Face. Women write about what they see when they look in the mirror. Her essays and fiction have appeared in numerous publications and venues, including Salon, NPR, and the Christian Science Monitor. And she is past winner of the Meridian's Editor's Prize in Fiction. She lives in New York City, which is where I am, my new, my new town. <laughs> Welcome, Anne. Thank you, Jeannie. It's great to be here. Well, we we love it, and we we all are so happy. To any debut novel is just a cause for celebration. But for women at, uh, in our stage in life, I think it's especially time to just pull out all the stops, celebrate, embrace, and support. And so, congratulations on this big milestone. Well, thank you, and it is super exciting for me to do that celebration here with Next Tribe because that's what you've created with this community. That's what everybody here is for. And I couldn't be more on board. Yay. Well, why don't you read a little bit? You have a little bit you're going to read so we can get a flavor of the of the book. And then we have lots of questions. I have questions and then we're going to anytime during the the while I'm talking to Ann, you can write your questions in the chat and then I'll call on you to um, you can ask them in her directly. So you can interact with the authors. It's always fun. So Anne, okay. let's let's hear a little bit if you want to set it up or, yep. or whatever. Okay, good. Thank you, Jeannie. Okay, and hi everybody. Thank you for being here on this um, Thursday evening with us. So I'm going to read a piece from the prologue of the book. So I'm not going to do too much setup because it's the the prologue. So if I have to do a lot of setup, that means I wrote it wrong <laughs> because it's the prologue. Uh, I will say one thing just though about the novel is that the prologue is set 20 years before the novel starts. As Jeannie said, it's set in contemporary Minnesota. Uh, but this is uh, an earlier, very brief scene of what the main character's background was. The dig. Before. It begins here in the city of Sarajevo, Bosnia, on a bitter November day in 1993. A city where minarets and steeples once shared the skyline, where men drinking cardamom-scented coffee from brass cups argued and sang into the night. In 1984, Olympic athletes skied down the slopes of Mount Igman to the cheers of the world. Only nine years later, the abandoned bobsled track overflows with stockpiles of Serbian artillery. The mosques are rubble. Petals of collapsed concrete, blown apart by shell after shell, pock the streets, gaping wounds that will be filled with scarlet resin when the bombings end. Sarajevo roses, they will call them, to commemorate the dead. A nondescript gray cinder block apartment complex looms above the bombed out buildings on the west side of the Malakia River. Imagine yourself there picking your way across the debris to building number four, carefully, slowly, while sirens wail around you. When you're close enough to touch the walls, wipe a circle in the dust that covers the ground floor window on the left. Look inside. At first, you won't see any signs of life, but don't turn away. Look closer. In the back corner of the darkened room, a three-year-old girl lies on the dirty floor under a cot. She stares at a diamond pattern of rusted bed springs above her head. Tufts of ticking from rips in the mattress hover over her like the clouds above the hills that ring the city. The scent of cabbage and garlic rises from the pot that's been simmering on the hot plate for hours. Her six-year-old brother huddles against her, 
pressing his sweaty hands over her ears to dull the sound of exploding concrete. Close your eyes, he says, but she's too frightened. Without shifting, she moves her head as much as she can until she sees the wedge of floor beneath the kitchen counter. Shards of glass and piles of concrete on green tile. Dust motes swirl in a gash of daylight streaming from a new hole in the front wall. The round yellow rug covered in soot, her stick horse crosswise atop it, one glazed button eye peering out from a pile of shattered brick. And from the corner of her field of vision, a pale hand motionless amid the debris, a hand whose wrist sports the brown sleeve of her mother's dress, the dress the girl helped fold that very morning, warm and sunsweet from the clothesline in the back. Wow. <laughs> I love how it's a, um, it's a different approach. It's, a, it's in second person. I mean, the way, it's a, so it's yeah. a different whole feel than the rest of, of it. Yeah. So as you'll, right. So as you read, you'll see, this is the girl herself. This is the main character, Antonia King, who is telling the story of her memory directly to the reader to set up the way that the, um, the book will continue. But the rest of the book is in first person. And uh, it is when Tony, Antonia King, is in her mid-20s and she's a lawyer starting a new job in Minneapolis. So um, so I, found, I met Anne, uh, I don't know, like a month or two months ago at an event next to a little coffee. And um, I was just so amazed. You said it was based on Antigone. And I, I remember when you said it, I was like, God, that was my classic. What do I remember the classics? But, <laughs> but tell me about the, the about that. How that book is that? Has that been a special book to you for for yeah to, uh, young since your young younger days? Um, no, actually, I uh, fell in love with the play Antigone, which is a an ancient Greek drama. Um, okay, when I was it. yeah, no, it's a book too. It's yeah. all good. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a classic. It's a classic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know it. I didn't read it in school. I know a lot of people do, but I'm happy to do a refresher because it's not like we all walk around being like, well, I do, but I'm weird. <laughs> thinking like, that's like what happened in Antigone. Um, but, you know, that's part of why, you know, writers and other creatives, we get obsessed with things, right? Yeah. And we just can't let them go. So I first experienced Antigone, not as the actual formal play itself, but as a reinterpretation by a choreographer, Annie B. Parsons, um, who... I saw it when I was in my 20s do like a really freeform version of it, but the themes were there. And I got really, I think, hooked in at that point of thinking, this is a mutable work. This is really interesting. Um, so just so nobody's, you know, like completely in the dark, because, you know, why would we remember this? So the play of Antigone is, uh, Antigone is this young woman, ancient Greece, and the story starts when her uncle, Creon, uh, has become king of Thebes in Greece. And there was a fierce battle between two different sides. One of Antigone's brothers fought on the side of Uncle Creon. The other fought against him in, in the rebels. And the boys killed each other in battle. So they are both dead. Creon, who becomes king, you know, says, okay, the brother who fought for me will be buried properly. The other brother does not deserve a proper burial because he went against the laws of the state. And Antigone says, I, I can't abide by this. Morally, I cannot let one of my brothers stay unburied because that was you know, a terrible, terrible right. thing. So Antigone has to make a choice. She has to make a choice between um, obeying the, the law or obeying you know, the gods in those days, or in our terms, right, her moral and ethical calling. So this central conundrum is so relevant for today's world, right? it could not be more vital in the things that we are all talking about um, as a nation, as, as a world, um, on all kinds of levels. So Antigone as a play has been revived um, across the country and also around the world many times in the past four or five years. So it's in the zeitgeist. Oh, that's well then perfect. So yes, yeah, so a young woman has to make a, a really difficult decision between um, between sides of her family, I guess, and also, but in a bigger, in, in, in your telling, it's, it's, it's kind of like family versus, well, there is the ethics, but also her career and her, what, what fuels her. Yeah, I mean, it's very loosely based in Antigone. I took the central dilemma of this character and this young woman trying to, you know, do what she believes is right. But my main character, Antonia, 
has multiple forces, as you're alluding to, kind of playing at her, including her own history. Um, so to give a little flavor without giving away any of the you know, plot twists that happen along the way, because this is a mystery. Yeah. Um, Antonia King, as you all heard, was found in a rubble in Sarajevo during the Bosnian genocide, and she and her brother were adopted by two American contractors. They brought her back to Minnesota and they were raised there in a small town. The action of the story takes place, as I mentioned, when Antonia is now in her mid-20s, she's graduated from law school and she thinks like she's gonna put her past behind her and have the career of her dreams. Maybe, you know, you could even call it the American dream, right? right? She gets a call in the middle of the night from her uncle and her uncle says, your brother's gone missing. You have to come back to your hometown and figure out what happened to him because you're the only one who knows him well enough to figure all this out. So she reluctantly goes back to this very small town where there are these forces that have just really dragged at her in multiple ways throughout her young life. And then over the course of a single day, and that's when the main action of the book takes place, Antonia not only figures out what happened to her brother, in fact, he went missing during um, a protest where a group of Somali refugees who have recently made inroads in a home in this small traditional Minnesota town um, were at risk of losing their community center to development for a mall that was led by the family business, the contractors that adopted Antonia. Antonia's brother, Paul, was defending the rights of the Somali community to keep their center. And that's where the central conflict in action is. So. What Antonia finds out is not only why her brother disappeared, but also she finds out truths about her past and her personal history and what happened in Sarajevo 20 years earlier that she never knew. So I'm just, I was struck by the kind of research you had to do for this. I mean, Sarajevo, um, could you have written this without it being her coming from Sarajevo? That, I mean, because I was like, gosh, did she go to Sarajevo? How did she like do all this, this research? Um, and and then the Somali community, there's there's lots of, of you know, I guess the whole American idea of who's American and who's not, maybe that's what you were trying to, to bring into it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also the experience from different uh, groups of refugees from very, very different, um, you know, worlds and experiences, but what I'm trying to do in writing a novel about this is go very close to characters and get to the emotional truths that are, you know, as universal as emotional truth can be, right? Even though the circumstances are different, the politics are different, the worlds are different. So uh, to answer your question about Sarajevo, it's, it's something that stuck with me actually longer than Antigone. The first place I ever traveled outside of the US was Sarajevo. Really? And this was, yeah, mm -hmm. and I was a teenager. Since we're all of an age here, I can say, yeah. Yeah. you know, I can't say it was long. I don't have to say, oh, it was really long ago. I can say yeah. <laughs> in recent memory, in 1987, yeah. I was um, a college student and I had not traveled to Europe before. I hadn't traveled out of the United States. Um, when I went to college, I fell in love with Slavic women's folk music. There was a women's folk music singing group that I had a friend in. I went to hear it. The music just captivated me and I auditioned and joined that singing group. So my sophomore year of college, we went and we toured what was then still Yugoslavia. It was still unified oh, under oh, Tito, right, right before the wall came down, it was 87. So it was like a, Eastern Europe is a really different world. Right. Um, the world was a different world. Um, so I land in Sarajevo and the first place that I uh, see outside of the States. And at that time, uh, in sort of the main streets of Sarajevo, there were mosques next to churches, next to mm -hmm. synagogues, and people visibly from all religions, from all faiths, mixing and mingling in the marketplace. And so I had this idea as a teenager of like, oh my gosh, it is possible to have a world of interfaith harmony. Um, and that moved me incredibly. Now, three years later, of course, everything shattered, the, you know, the Balkan Wars and the, the Bosnian genocide. And because though I had had that really formative early experience, um, being in Sarajevo as a very young and impressionable person, it ripped my heart out. Um, and also, you know, when you love something about a culture, with, whether it's music or art or, or, you know, a person, an experience, 
and it gets to you. That that's how I felt so deeply about being in Sarajevo and about Bosnian culture. So it never left me. And so I have to say that is a hundred percent why Sarajevo and this Bosnian background was part of what I needed to wow. do to make these characters come to life. And so when how long before I mean after you you were there in 87 when was when were the Olympics was that before or after that was before so 1984 was uh, the Sarajevo Olympics and right. I do mention that in yeah. in the in the book and I even had the opportunity to see you know this is this happens so often right Jeannie so like there is all of this attention and they built up this big course and the bobsleds and everything and the world was focused on Sarajevo and then the economy can't sustain everything after you know everybody leaves and and right. lets it go and so everything falls into complete disrepair and it was just a, a, a one piece of the economic and personal and human tragedies that happened um in that region and I think you say that during the war, the, the ski jump was used for storage or, or something. Serbian, yeah. yeah. Serbian artillery. So, yeah. So that was part of the research process, which you yeah. also asked about. So, you know, this was not anything that I had at the tip of my tongue. Um, I needed to really dive deep and do as much research as I could on all of the varieties of histories that I wanted to make sure that my characters carried with them uh, appropriately and well. So not only did I do um, the kind of research that we all do on the Google and yeah. in all kinds of other things, but um, I spoke with survivors of genocide in wow. Bosnian genocide. Now, um, I also worked for many years at an organization, and one of my former colleagues is here, hi Chris, uh, called Facing History in Ourselves. And that's an education organization that helps teachers and students at the secondary school level really grapple with some of the biggest, most deep and dark times in human history, whether it's genocide, crimes against humanity, um, you know, racism, anti-Semitism, all kinds of really, really hard, hard lessons of history by looking at it in the context of adolescent development and human behavior. So I spent many years as a professional because as you mentioned, I didn't debut my novel until I was age 55. And, you know, shocker, it's not because I was writing it from the time I was 25 till I was 55. And I suddenly emerged from my study after 30 <laughs> years with a final book. Nope, I had to do a couple other things like raise children and work full time and have a very full and rich life and work I really cared deeply about. And I cared deeply about this. One of the things I took away from doing this work, and I was the chief communications officer for this organization, was the, the power of the stories of survivors of all kinds of backgrounds, of all kinds of crimes against humanity, genocide, any kind of you know, powerful way of educating a person who hasn't experienced it is to really meet somebody who has. Right. Um, and wow. that's, what fiction, that's what fiction does, right? You're yeah. meeting somebody in, in right. a fictional world and you're spending however many hours with them and, and hearing their story. I didn't realize that, you, you, I mean, so that that part of your work really contributed to the, like Antonia, how she's dealing with her life and, and the new information that she gets and things yep. like that. You kind of, yep. you've really been in there with people who've, who've, who've gone through that. I, right. I, and, I, and yeah, and all I needed to do really um, for myself is to say that, you know, since I, I am not a Bosnian genocide survivor. So one of the things that was important to me was Antonia is a very American character too, because we, you know, unless we are native born or from native communities, all of us in some way, shape or form have immigrant or refugee or both history in us, right? So Tony came to this country when she was three. I made very careful, um, uh, process notes about three-year-olds. What is it like to be three and have memories and then be 23 and have memories? And a lot of what Antonia knows about her past is because her brother was six and he told her more. And that's part of why, hence the title of the book, she digs up a yeah. lot more about her past than, than she remembers. And she was raised and adopted in a family uh, whose ethos was, for better or for worse, you're an American now, forget where you came from. There's nothing good that can come from hanging on to past. You have to think about the future. Right. And that's a pretty familiar way of approaching the world 
too, I think that a lot of us have experienced. And I, I, I find it also interesting the different ways that she and her brother dealt with, with that. That it kind of gives the t- probably the two, two major ways that uh, refugees coming either you know try to, to move on and become really American or they really try to hang on to it. Her brother was more in, uh, focused on hanging on to what happened and, and, and not being sucked into you know, the, the, the consumerism wealthy part of, of the U.S. Mm-hmm. Comp- or U.S. society. So it was a, yeah. a, that in and of itself was a conflict. There are just so many, yeah. so, uh, there's so many different points of conflict that when you, when you, when I was reading it, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, and I have to say it's, it's such an intricate plot. And, and we, we were chatting about this a little before. I don't know how you kept kept track of all the different things. It happens in one day, which is amazing, but it feels like so much more has happened in that day because of the, the way you, you made this plot mesh. How, how did you keep track? For, so for those of you who haven't read it, the, uh, the plot, of the story, it, it, it alternates between this one day in the present tense, the present day of the story, and then memories that of, of uh, different points of, of Antonia's childhood, which brings in all of that backstory. Um, so I love index cards. I have a lot of index cards. I handwrite all of my first drafts, first of all, and then I keep those what? notepads. Yeah, I know. I'm wow. old school. What can I say? But it works for me. Like I, that's how I do it. And then I will, my second draft is actually retyping and editing, and then I'll start yeah. moving things around from there. Um, and I did, as I said, lots and lots of research. Um, and it's a matter of just, there's so many drafts and going through things so many times that each draft at a certain point becomes sort of like hunting for threads. Right. So, you know, you say about, okay, I have to make sure that I've woven the, the, the thread of the story of the uncle all the way through. So I'm going to do an uncle draft and you do a kind of all that. I'm going to do a cousin draft and do all of that. And then in those drafts, it's all about trying to keep those pieces going. Um, but the other thing is, so I don't want to scare anybody off from reading it who thinks, oh, this is intricate. It's also no, it's a highly readable, turner. highly it's readable. Page turner. Yeah, it is a page purpose. turner. It, it was a page turner because you you felt where she was, you know, you felt the, the tension of like, okay, I've got to I've got to report back something for work, but I've got to take care of this and oh, oh, oh I gotta pretend like I'm on it for this work thing, you know. <laughs> You're like yeah. Oh. Get back to that work thing. <laughs> um, I, I think Ruth has a, a note, a question for you. Ruth, do you want to um, you want to say hi and ask your question? Sure. Um, I'll even put my thing on. Um, yeah. I was struck, and first, I just want to say it's a page turner. It is incredibly intricate and it's masterful, but not in a way where I felt like daunted by that. I told Anne I had this delicious read with her book. And I just couldn't put it down. But anyway, my question is this, the main character kind of oddly brought me back to like my childhood, my favorite books, where there was this young woman who was just like super strong and was figuring things out. And she really solves all the problems that everybody else is ignoring or sweeping under the carpet. And I wondered like if that part of the character, if that came from any childhood love of those kinds of women and books, or if that was just something that I saw in it. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Ruth. Um, also, I, I love the pendants in your kitchen. They're really, really yeah. nice. Um, yeah, that's a that's wonderful. I mean, as you know, since you have read it, my Antonia comes up as a point of reference in this book. But yeah, even before, um, you know, my mom is here um, also, and she's somebody who uh, I <laughs> knows the kind of reader I was as well as a really young girl, and I loved, I loved books where there was any kind of epic experience with a strong female character. Um, you know, I became obsessed with a lot of the books that I think, you know, growing up in the Midwest, um, uh, which I did until I was about nine, uh, are part of that, the canon of that time, even though there are issues now, like the, the Little House books, you know, very, very powerful piece. I think I, I read every single one of those multiple times, you know, I'm, uh, dozens I'm not exaggerating. Um, you know, Little Women was a huge part of my childhood experience as well. Those two 
experiences like are just sort of so deeply ingrained in my idea as a kid of what a protagonist was. Um, the other, you know, I read the All of a Kind family series, if anybody knows what those were as well, um, young Jewish immigrants on the uh, Lower East Side. And I read those many, many times as well. And there were five sisters. So yeah, I've always been fascinated by young women and uh, as protagonists, it's a great question. That, yeah, she and she is a great, because she's so smart and yeah, but she also has a very, she, I mean, uh, she's not a prim or prude, I mean, you know what I mean? She's like yeah. a real, so real because she has, you know, I won't say flaws, but she, you can, you can identify with she, her. She has flaws. <laughs> She has flaws. I mean, she makes a lot of mistakes. She's very headstrong and she's very willful and she sort of like puts her foot in it a lot and has to figure out how to get her foot out of it. Um, and that's part of what her journey is, is figuring out how she's going to kind of get to her own next level of growth. Um, but I also, uh, you know, there's maybe something of a, of a maybe um, Ramona the Pest about her too, or Harriet the Spy or, you know, these you know, strong-willed young women that you know are gonna barrel through and do amazing things and care about the world, but they've got a lot to learn about how to be in the world too. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, um, you know, one thing you were talking about being a page turner, and I think that's so hard to, to it's it's a very, um, you know, you're, the writing is beautiful. And so you, you it's kind of a, it's a, it's commercial in the sense that it's a, it's a, great read but it's very literary at the same same time which congratulations that's I know that's like so difficult to do but I wonder how you what your thoughts of how you keep that page turning that suspense that you know it's like you almost like you know you insert in different points little questions or or right or yeah a lot, little little issues that need to be solved that keep building to the bigger one or but I don't know what your how you think about that kind yeah. of thing. Uh, well, that was a deliberate craft choice for sure. I studied mysteries in order to figure out how I wanted to write the dig. When mm -hmm. I figured out that I wanted it to be a mystery, because I, I didn't know that when I started writing, actually, you know, I felt that I felt that energy, frankly, from Antigone from the source material. Um, you know, when you think about it in ancient Greece, the theater was so important because that was where you could, you know, be in the presence of stories that acted out these, these big fears and big emotions and big feelings that people had about the uncertainties in the world. And, you know, theater was the thing then, you know, we didn't have the same, we didn't have, um, you know, Amazon or, you know, <laughs> Audible or, you know, you didn't, in Greece, they weren't like, oh, listen to this, get your, your you know, AirPods in and do yeah. this. Um, there's a reason why that catharsis came from Aristotle, right? Like his theory of, of drama is that you build to a catharsis and you have this emotional release as a result of experiencing drama and that that's Kind of the human experience in connection with um with art mm. so um i felt like this was a mystery in ancient greece this was it, it took place in one day and there was a lot of action and i thought how can i translate that without it being um you know a play because i did couldn't write a play i wanted to write a novel into today's kind of parlance and to me that was a mystery that was writing a mystery but i hadn't written mysteries before you know i had started other novels and gotten pretty far in them but they were very literary without the mystery overlay and i went to an mfa program when i was young and 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 learned like many of us did who did that um how to well not how to because there's no how to but we learned about literary fiction we were expected to be literary writers which is what i came up with what i adore what i love but we weren't taught how to do plot you know that was almost looked down upon you know as lesser and I don't, why would that be, right? For a reader, it's it's just about immersion and experience and, and traveling somewhere with the characters. So I set a task for myself to learn how to do what you just pointed out plot-wise, which is keep those pages turning. Um, and one of the devices that great mystery, re, re, uh, sorry, writers always use is the ticking clock. The idea that there is a, a time frame that you impose over your character to get the reader and the characters anxious at the same pace. Right. So you turn those pages because time is running out. Now I did it literally, it's kind of flat-footed, honestly, the way I did it. I mean, I'm glad it worked, 
But uh, to talk about writing process, I gave myself that task as a first draft task to get the words on the page, to say, all right, I'm going to see if I can write a book that happens in 24 hours. It's a challenge, you know, let's see if I meet that challenge. I can always go back in a second draft and change it if it doesn't work. But I kept it because I felt like it did work and it was exciting and interesting to me. Um, I will say I did cheat a little bit because I gave myself the summer solstice, which is the longest day of the year. So <laughs> That's you really know. funny. Yeah, that's funny. Like, <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna have a lot of things happen, you might as well have an extra couple hours yeah, of daylight hours to of get daylight. it all done. Yes, yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm, I'm intrigued by, you know, I mean, you said earlier, you know, you've had a rich life and you did this other work, you raised children, you, you had a full-time job. And, you know, Next Tribe is a, a lot of us, a lot of what we write about is this time of life when we get to, um, if, we're, if we're lucky, is to, to pursue those things that we didn't do before or the things that we learned about ourselves. You know, we, we're always learning about ourselves as we, as we get older. And this is, to me, is like a great time to accomplish something big because you know so much more than you did when you were, you know, in your 20s, 30s, whatever. So tell me about your, have you always wanted to write fiction? I and mean, it, it sounds like you, you had your MFA program. You yeah. said you started other novels. Yeah. Uh, yep. I've, oh, I have always wanted to write fiction, but I've strayed away from that. You know, that was a childhood dream and a love also. You know, I had notebooks filled with characters and, and stories always as a, a kid. And I, was very devoted in into high school. I was a very devoted creative writer. Um, and then I started college, I went to Yale and I got really intimidated. There, there are a lot of really, really? smart and uh, yeah, shocking. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean start there were like intimidating people there. I mean, come on, it was scary. <laughs> It's a big world. I think the fact that you're at Yale, that to me is intimidating. So there you go. Oh, uh, okay. But you know what? There's so many layers, just like you said, of like, you know, when you're young, there are more layers of intimidation than I think there are layers of self that you still have to kind of, climb. it's like a ladder you have to climb up. Like, okay, I'm over this intimidation. Like, oh crap, here's another one. Yeah. Okay, here I go. I'm going to keep yeah, going, yeah. right? And um, to your point of just knowing more when you're older, you know, I had to just my own personal human beingness meant that I was easily intimidated by people that I thought were faster, smarter, better, more accomplished writers. And, you know, the first time, you know, we have to talk about rejection, I think, as, you know, real adults and having gone through many cycles of rejection, you know, you're, you're an author too, you know the world, it is brutal and hard from the get-go. And so I just, I don't think I had just the kind of the emotional wherewithal to deal with being told that my work wasn't good until I was older. Now, I kept coming back to it though. There was that, that drive, that need, but I kept trying to find other passions. And I was somebody who, you know, as I said before, I sing as well. And I was involved in theater and I had a lot of other passions. Um, I used to dance. Um, and so at various points I said, ah, oh, screw this writing thing. I'm too scared, it's too hard. Yeah, go away, I'm gonna do these other things. Um, but then it would keep, you know, like biting me. I, it would just say, no, you, you're not allowed. And I just had to keep doing it until finally I just still had to keep doing it. And, um, and I always did it. I always came back to it. Even when I stuck all those notebooks, you know, in a box and shoved them in a corner, I still came back to it. Um, for me, one of the interesting uh, kind of evolutions uh, over time of being a writer is when I had kids, I actually had to turn away from fiction. Um, I found my brain as a mom of a very small child was just didn't have the capacity for roaming into an imaginative space. I was just like, you know, I mean, you know, literally like your child is at risk of dying if you're like in an imaginary world, right? Right. right. It, it's, it was too much. So I wrote essays. Um, and I published a lot of essays and I edited a couple of collections of essays. And, and that was really, um, you know, great, really meaningful work. The other thing about essays is they're short. You can, you know, there's enough nap times in the day that you can <laughs> get them done over time. Novels are, are hard. My, like my hat is off to all of the parents who are working and parenting and somehow can get up at four in the morning and right. work on their book. And, and I also 
talking about those ladders of intimidation you had to climb, I berated myself for a long time when I was you know, in my 30s that I couldn't be that person, that I just, I, but I didn't have the energy. I just couldn't do it. So I didn't do it. The dig, it is no coincidence that I finally got my first novel to completion, uh, the novel that I started when my kids went away to college. Mm. So that's, so you started the dig when they went away to college. And yeah. you, did you, you felt like I finally have time to let it inhabit my brain or my, yeah. I have, I've had the, you know, the safety of letting my brain go on to imaginary mode. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, they were, you know, other than other than when they were learning how to drive, they were fairly safe, you know, from you know, <laughs> I could be in imaginary mode, but it was time. I mean, you know, we only have so much time with work and yeah, I don't have yeah. to explain that to this crowd. Um, so, yes, at in my mid 50s, it does feel like kind of a new kind of cracking open of possibility in terms of being able to focus on what I what I want to focus on right yep. and you know that's not to say that there aren't pushes and pulls from the outside world I mean always of course but my relationship to those pushes and pulls has changed um and not just because the kids have grown up but because of my own um maturity um sometimes yes sometimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm hoping to get less mature I think I'm doing it in some ways <laughs> actually I think I'm I'm going to the That's less mature good. side. Yeah, it is good. I, I like it. I think you because we've we've you know a lot of us spend a lot of time being hemmed in by expectations, you know, raising the kids and and everything. But I do love that like the idea of you, you felt like it was time. You, what did you say? You cracked open, or the the your your possibilities were opened up. So yeah. so you actually started working on it. Then when? when like how many years ago was that? So that was um, in the spring of 2018 that I really started. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. I started, that's when my kids uh, got into college. Um, and another thing that happened, and this is also a very important piece of, you know, what is going on with a lot of people at our age too, is um, actually my job was eliminated. Um, and that happened actually the day before my kids, no, the day after. So sorry, this is an important Yes. Projection. Yes. Right. My kids committed to their colleges of their choice. And then the next day I found out that I didn't have a job. So that was fun. That wow. was fun, Jeannie. That was a <laughs> good time. <laughs> I, was like, I, imagine. I had a great week. It was just magnificent. Oh my gosh. Okay. So but but I, I really am I'm pressing you on this because I think that it's so important uh for women who are listening or who are yeah. see this on Facebook or on, in our, we, we put everything as a video, but I think, and I really wanted to explore this, that idea that you, there is still time, there is possibilities, there is, you know, yes. you look dark, your job's limited, your kids are going away, and, and, and I know you've been through some personal things, we're all, you know, there's just like all kinds of things that, that can go on, but there, the, the, there is an opportunity for great creativity or great, yeah. Uh, fulfilling your life in a, in a way you maybe didn't know you were going to, or that was possible. So I could not believe that more. And I absolutely say that to uh, my women, women, friends of mine who are my age and older to people I meet that, you know, that, that is the most valuable thing. I think that our stage of life that we can harness, whatever that means. And it doesn't have to be some kind of thing that, that's an accomplishment that you check off a, a box on. Right. It doesn't have to be something. I mean, for me, it happens to be something that I have tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed and finally could break through and do. But it can be also saying, you know, screw what I used to want to do. Mm -hmm. I've seen that with people too. And that is magical to say, you know what? I actually don't want to do this anymore. My younger self wanted to do it, but the the truth is, I don't want to do it. I want to just stop writing or I want to stop, you know, beating my head against the wall of saying that I need to, you know, exercise every <laughs> single minute of every single day. Like, I don't care anymore because I have time that belongs uh, in, in a, a space that I have to be able to control it. Like, it, it, you know, this has to be under my control in some way because circumstances never are. But my choices of what I do from my heart with the time um, that I have to myself, I have to be able to say, 
this matters to me and I don't have to prove anything to anybody else, but it has to matter. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that to me, like what matters to you? What matters to you really? And, and yes, our families, of course, the people we love, that, that matters. And it is hard when the kids leave. And it is hard if you, you know, had a job that you care about and you don't have that job anymore. Um, I also reinvented on a professional level. I became a consultant to, um, I created my own business and started a communications consultancy and parlayed that into some of the most interesting work I've ever done that I started in my mid fifties. Um, and that was hard. I mean, none of this is easy. There's a lot of like tears and fears and all of that stuff. Um, but um, I'm really proud, honestly, honestly, I'm super proud. And I'm super grateful to be able to talk to other people who have similar um, right. needs. And how do you bust that out, whatever that is? So, and it's great that you were able to create a, a, a money making, you know, a business for yourself that could help that gave you some flexibility so you could work on, I mean, so you could That's work right. on the book. So um, I know you talked about lots of different drafts because you were, you know, you do a draft looking at the uncle, whatever, but how many drafts do you think you went through before you were sent it to an agent or did you have an yeah. agent? beforehand? Or I had, I did have an agent. Um, I got an agent from an earlier project that I was working on. Um, I would say, okay, so I did my, my first draft. And if anybody here is a writer or creative, you might have at some point in your life encountered Annie Lamott's Bird by Bird, right? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, right. So mm -hmm. she has a, like a great sort of, um, she calls it the down draft, the first draft. She's like, get it down. She also talks about writing shitty first drafts, which is yeah. very empowering. And she talks about writing like teeny weeny little pieces of it and saying, okay, I did my piece today. But so, so draft one is the down draft and that's like the brain dump almost, right? Mm -hmm. And that's usually a disastrous mess. Uh, draft number two, she calls it's the up draft. It's like, okay, what are you gonna pick up from this big kind of pile of um, you know potatoes and onions and carrots <laughs> that are just strewed all over the you know kitchen floor at this time because you've been going like this with the soup you're gonna make. And what are you gonna put in the stew? Like that's the updraft. And then the third draft is really like, okay, how do I make this into art? How do I craft this? How do I take this and say on a sentence by sentence level, this is as good as I can make it this round. Yeah. So at that point, um, I, I went to my agent and I said, help me out. And I have an agent who likes to get into it and be an editor. And that's what she did with me. And then she said, okay, these parts, yep. These other parts, I don't get it. This isn't working. This character, I don't understand this conclusion. What can you do to make this more interesting? And so the actual plot, changed over the course of those revisions. So I did, I would say, three more full revisions after that. Um, and then lots of tweaking revisions where like a little piece would need something or because I changed something near the end of the book, I would have to go back to the beginning and make sure that literally every single page did not include a version of like, you know, if you named a character Kathy and you decided to change her name to Matilda, you yeah. better not have any Kathy's left in that draft. And it's not as simple as search and find because right, right. if you do that, it could just, you know, you're, you have like maybe 400 Kathy's where you're supposed to have a Jill. I mean, you don't know what's <laughs> going on, right? It really is that handcrafting. Um, and then at, uh, you know, finally after uh, back and forth of about uh, a year or so with my agent, she said, okay, I think this is ready to take out on the marketplace. Um, and then this was, uh, shoot, this was, beginning of October of 2021. Okay. Um, and then I got 22 rejections from publishers. Okay, this is important because we we're saying, you know, we got, we're, we're grownups now, we've got to be able to be prepared for the real world. 22 yep. rejections, tell us how, tell, how do you? It was great, Jean. Oh my God. It was <laughs> terrific. I felt good every moment that somebody rejected my work. <laughs> It was very, you know, it was painful. There were moments when I thought I've, you know, I've, I've, I've embarrassed myself. This is, um, you know, and, and there wasn't a lot of information from these rejections and they were all, all over the place. Like one editor would say, I loved the beginning. I don't understand the end. The other would say the beginning was slow. I love the end. You know, um, you can try to read between the lines, but for whatever reason, it's a business, you know, publishing is a business. And at that moment and at that time, 
the people that it went to first and second and third and 20th, oh. <laughs> it wasn't, it didn't fit their business plan. Um, but all it took was that one yes. And Counterpoint Press is a beautiful independent publisher that does, you know, wonderful work. It's, it, it, and I was just over the moon when they said oh. yes. Oh. You know, one thing that you alluded to early in this interview actually was kind of a detriment in getting it published, which is that it's both a literary family drama and a mystery. Yeah. And it's not easily categorized in a world that wants to say, you know, what lane is this going to fit into on the sales rack? Right. right. Well, it's both actually. Um, so it's a little bit of a harder uh, thing to just sort of say, you know, uh, off the shelf, oh, this is exactly like this, or it's exactly like that. Right, right. Um, so uh, what I hope for this book, in, and I think, you know, it'll find its way in the world. People who are reading it are, you know, wonderful advocates for it. I think it's going to be a word of mouth, you know, find this book, recommend it to a friend. I think you're going to really like it. And, and hopefully, you know, it'll grow and, and do what it wants to do in the world. And so I like to find out what writers, um, when they, what, how do you want the readers to feel when they finish the book? I know, you know, mm. it, it's just kind of like, what, what do you want them to, what do you hope they walk, walk away with? Or, you know, think about? That's a great question. Um, well, one of the important themes to the, in the book to me um, is actually in the epigraph in the beginning from Antigone. Um, and it's the, the I'll, I'll read the quote. The quote okay. from the play is, um, it's the dead, not the living, who make the longest demands. Mm. I guess I want people to think about that and not, I, I put that there not because I believe it, but because it's a powerful question that I think as human beings, we all struggle with, you know, who, uh, who am I, uh, who are my ancestors, who are my parents, who are my children, who, who do I uh, need to be in service to or with myself, my nation, which is one of the questions in this book, my, my history, which is another question in this book. So through the eyes of this one young woman who is on a journey to stop denying her history and start finding a way to coexist with it, I guess I hope readers um, really feel that feeling of, um, of wanting to struggle like Antonia does to accept in the parts of our histories, not only the ones that we know, but you know, maybe some of those holes where there are parts that we don't know that that might still be driving our behavior, even in ways that we can't understand because we really don't know why. Yeah, interesting. I, I was just talking to someone today about, she said that there's research now that a lot of this is not just what we experienced as children growing up, but that we're also impacted but by what ancestors or you know our mm. parents what they experience and in in some way that gets wrapped up in our dna i don't i i, I and that made me think about your book because of mm. you know there's just so much that that her family ex experienced in in sarajevo and then she's in this really nice very wealthy family but it's it's always going to be kind of a barrier mm. of some sort because right. What but you, then that's family too, you know, your adopted family is family. I mean, these are rich, complicated, you know, kind of both you know, kind of tears at your heart, but also uh, tapestries in your heart as well. And I thought, did you live in, have you lived in Minnesota? Is, you said you, lived, you grew up in the Midwest. No, no. Uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in uh, Chicago and Ann Arbor, mostly Ann Arbor until I was nine and then moved uh, to Connecticut, actually. Yeah. So most of my childhood was in, in Connecticut, but it was in a small town, similar to the small town that I created in Minnesota. And I think being from the Midwest, you know, originally as a kid, there was a, there was an ethos, there's a, a world I could authentically write. And then I did a ton of research. And, you know, again, these are all imaginary communities. The, the community of Thebes is imaginary. So they just have to feel emotionally possible. But in my imaginary version of this world in this book, Minnesota was a very important place for me to set this because there is a reality in which Minnesota is the place where there are more communities of immigrants and refugees from different 
eras of crimes against humanity than any other state. The, the laws are very, very open to resettlement and the employment is good. And so uh, the particular communities that I wanted to explore were both very um, rooted in Minnesota after having survived the genocides and the wow. crimes that they did, which is the Bosnian genocide. And then 20 years later, uh, the Somali community that came here. Wow, that's okay. That's the where they come together. The the yep. her story and then the, the Somali. Yep. Right. I see my friend Lisa, who is from Minnesota, is joined us here. So we have an authentic Minnesotan here is here with us. Um, oh, hi, hi Lisa. Lisa. You do. She, she's a sick. I'm a sick Lisa from Minnesota. So I'm. Oh. I have to be horizontal. I I caught some sort of a, a flu, but I and so. I was. I just had to. I just had. Okay, go, go, yes. go relax. No, but that's I just okay. Had to, I, I, I just you, had to note the real Minnesota. Yes, the real here, Minnesota. <laughs> well, does she? But I didn't grow up in small town Minnesota, so I'm sure your research is much more authentic than I could. Uh, and are you? Share. Are you happy with how Minnesota is portrayed, or, or did she get? Did she? Did well, she actually, I haven't read Anne's book yet because I'm hoping that my book group will read it together. That's what I'm, I'm happy to come. Please. I know. I, will, what I, was I love coming. Anybody who has book groups, please. Yes. I love book groups. I would happily come. Yeah. And Lisa, yes, I'm all in. I'm yes. actually, he I'm headed to the Twin Cities in a couple of weeks to do some readings. I, and I'm actually going to be saw doing an interview mm -hmm. on, um, on Minnesota Public Radio. So oh, that's are you? Be really fun. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I posted, that. I posted the, um, you're doing a reading in St. Paul, I think. I, I am. I posted it on my Facebook page so all my Minnesota friends will see it. Great. So, yeah. and for anybody who doesn't know my my information, you can find me at anbertwriter.com and follow me um, on all of the social channels on Facebook and Instagram. I don't do Twitter, but find uh, me there if you want to find my events if they're anywhere near you. I'm going to put your your um, your website here in the chat. And so tell us um, then what, what you're doing next. What's, what can we, are you working on anything? Are you, are you thinking plotting out your next, your next novel? Uh, yes, I am. So I've got two projects that I'm working on. Um, one actually is a novel that also has a, a Greek influence to it. So I wanna say that it's a very different kind of a novel, but I guess I kind of caught the bug, um, the retelling bug and I love it. Oh, oh no, wait, I just lost my AirPod, hold on. Oh God. <laughs> If anybody has advice for like having ears that work better with AirPods, let me know. Can you hear me again? <laughs> Did I come back? Yeah, no, okay. no, you weren't gone at all. Oh, okay. That's good. Just they yeah. fall off all the time. I feel like, you know, um, do you remember the Bugs Bunny cartoons when like the witch would get on her broom and then her hairpins would fly out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I always feel when my, when my, when my AirPods fly out, like if I'm on the <laughs> treadmill or something, I'm like, bah. um, and, and I'm also, I'm working, uh, on, a straight up thriller as well. So two different projects. Oh my gosh, congratulations. So you, well, you've obviously mastered the, the suspense and, and uh, the craftsmanship that goes into building suspense. So I'm, and I love thrillers, so I'm, I can't wait for that. And uh, yes, and we just, and I'm gonna see you soon in, in New York for an event. But uh, we thank you so much for coming, Anne, and congratulations. Oh. We, I really, truly loved the, the book and just could not, I listened to it and the voicing was great. And I was, I was, I didn't want to stop. I hated when people oh, interrupted God. me. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, the narrator in the audio book is wonderful. She's just a, got a fantastic uh, way of, of telling the story. Yes, I no, loved she, her. She, she was really great. So everything about it is, fabulous and worthy of great praise and integrity. You. Uh, you did did that story proud. So I'm sure <laughs> you did a good job of transporting it to, to what matters today. Well, thank you, Jeannie. And thank you for Next Tribe, because I I love the fact that I'm talking to a community of, you know, women who are 50 and older who are interested in doing exciting, vibrant, new things and yes. it means a lot to me to be here with what i feel like is my community and you've created this community and kudos to you for bringing us all together oh, thank you thank you so much and to everyone take care thanks for coming tonight thank you all right take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.